With another excellent draft class in tow, the Seahawks have lofty expectations heading into the 2023 season. Just how high can they climb in the NFC West and NFC standings? ESPN analyst Mina Kimes is going to be breaking it all down, joining us as a special guest on our Blue Friday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12s. This is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang, and a special thanks to all the 12s out there, as always, for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. We are in the heat of the offseason. Training camp now less than two months away from starting. Football is drawing close. So who better to break down the state of the Seahawks than ESPN analyst and Etch-A-Sketch artist, Mina Kimes. We greatly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule, Mina, to talk Seahawks and NFL with us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm excited because you guys are obviously more plugged into the team in the offseason than me. So I'm hoping I can learn a little bit about uh, the state of the Seahawks from talking to you. Yeah, we're really interested in from the you know an outsider perspective. Even though you are a Seahawks fan, that outsider perspective covering all the teams, I think, is going to be really fascinating. But let's start with the man of the hour, Geno Smith, and we look back at where we were this time last year. I know that Rob was one of them saying Drew Locke is going to win this starting job. I was on the side of Geno Smith, but I don't think anybody thought that he was going to have the season that he had last year, winning comeback player of the year getting the Pro Bowl selection for the first time in his career. He's got a new three-year contract. Looking back at how he performed last year, replacing Russell Wilson, Mina, what surprised you the most in his stellar play, and what does he have to do to take that next step to get all those escalators that he has on his contract for the Seahawks? Well, to put his performance in context, um, on my pod, the Mina Kime Show featuring Lenny, we just drafted quarterbacks with a three-year timeline. Uh, I had Steven Ruiz on, who is a known Geno Smith supporter. He works for The Ringer. But both him and I had Geno in the same area in our rankings, which was around 9 to 10, which is amazing. If you could go back two years and say, of all the quarterbacks in the NFL, if you're going to be drafting and picking a guy that you want starting for your team for the next three years, I don't think anybody would have thought, you know, you'd be taking Geno Smith there. Um, so I, I, to me, um, that reflects a couple of things. One, part of the reason why I think Geno's performance is um, not a one-off, you know, and that regression isn't, or at least dramatic regression doesn't loom, is that this is a guy who really didn't get a chance for many years. His career arc in the NFL is very unusual. So it wasn't like he came... Um, you know, he was terrible for five years and then suddenly had this big breakout. He literally did not play for many years, right? Or just in spot starts here and there, um, which suggests that he wasn't given an opportunity. He also played in a way that I think usually bodes well for the future, which is he was very good inside a clean pocket, which tends to be a stable statistic year to year. Um, yeah, he was an assassin from the pocket is what I said. I, I think, you know, I had always thought Gino had a good arm dating back to college. He was accurate. I, I think what surprised me the most, to answer your question, and I just uh, posted a play uh, kind of reflecting this on Twitter, was the playmaking. Um, some of what he did outside of structure, throwing on the move, create the creativity he displayed. Those were qualities that I didn't know he had as a quarterback. Um, and so I think he he is actually in that range where he's not one of the many quarterbacks in the NFL you win with, but he can actually elevate the offense around him, which is pretty cool. Yeah, um, thank you. I just want to kind of echo what, what Corbin had said a moment ago, Mina. Um, you know, just thanking you so much for, for joining us here. And, uh, you know, just – your explanation of what you saw with Geno Smith, you know, going back to his days at, at West Virginia and obviously what he did this past season. Uh, you know, I, I think that if for anybody who was not a Seahawks fan that then just started watching the Seahawks last year, 
the you know, the kind of chip on the shoulder with which they played, especially Gino. Um, I think that it would be easy to have those people become Seahawk fans just because of, you know, we, we all kind of root for the underdog and who possibly could have been more of an underdog than, than Geno Smith, considering that long layoff before he had his opportunities, as you mentioned. I'm curious about you. I'm curious about what made you such a Seahawk fan um, or, or earlier in your life. Was it watching something as, sim- as uh, recent as Geno Smith or the Russell Wilson era, Matt Hasselbeck? How far does your Seahawk appreciation i certainly don't want to call yeah. you a fan considering all your success but how far is your no, i'm a fan go i'm a fan uh i i would i can't really lie about it at this point because it predates my career at espn um it's part of the reason why i'm at espn is i got into um I would say sports media. I was a business journalist from being part of the, uh, just a Seahawks community with my friend, Danny Kelly, who used to edit field goals. Um, for me, I was just born into it. My dad is from Seattle. So I was always Seattle sports, Mariners, Sonics, Washington football and Seahawks from the jump. Uh, so, you know, I, my fandom goes back to being a kid. Um, and you know, a lot of my favorite Seahawks are from, the nineties, early two thousands, just when I was, it was a kid, but, uh, yeah, it's something that I've, uh, I, I actually kind of joke. I actually said this to John Schneider at the combine a couple of years ago. I think at ESPN being, um, someone who covers the league more broadly, I actually think sometimes I'm harder on the Seahawks than, um, uh, maybe some of my colleagues. And I think some of that does actually flow from the fact that I don't want to be, you know, a Homer covering the team. And also when, you know, a team pretty well. I think you can be more critical. Um, although I, I was very positive last year. Yeah. That's one of the big things here with the positivity aspect is that obviously making the playoffs last year when nobody thought they were going to make the playoffs outside of the building, they're going into this year with a lot of different expectations. But before we get to the big picture, I know that you're big on EPA and you and you look at analytics closely and there's the arguments about the value of running backs and the Seahawks now have taken a running back in the second round, not once, but two consecutive seasons. They got Ken Walker the third last year. He finished as a runner up for rookie of the year. He still believes he should have won that award. I think he should have won that award, but he finishes second place. And then Seattle drafts another one in Zach Charbonnet. So you've got the explosive walker, and then you've got a glass of Charbonnet to go with that in the backfield. How did you feel about that selection (laughs) based on what we know, at least data-wise, the value of running backs and where Seattle stood with only having a couple players on the depth chart at that position? Yeah, there's kind of two sides of this, right? Which is how do you feel about the player and how do you feel about the value and the need? Um, I really love the player. I'll, I'll get into that in a second. The value and the need, I thought it w- uh, didn't make a ton of sense to me, especially given some of the other holes on the roster, some of the other players that were available there. It's not what I would have done or wished for the team in terms of maximizing the draft picks they had. Um, so that said, um, I do really like the player. He was my running back three. Uh, and it was very clear cut after I got a chance to go back and, and watch all the the backs in preparation for the draft. Um, I thought after Bijan, he was the most complete running back. I think I had Jameer Gibbs above him because of his explosiveness and what he brings to the table as a pass catcher. But Charbonnet, I thought, was so balanced. Um, a guy who's kind of just good at everything, frankly. Uh, very efficient, breaks tackles, runs with good vision, a smart back. I think there's... Um, a decent pass can be a decent pass protector in the NFL and then a really underrated um, pass catcher too. He has really nice hands. Um, you know, at, at, in college, he was a really reliable check down option. I wouldn't be surprised if he plays the same role for Seattle. So, um, you know, in terms of getting the Seahawks depth, we'll see how he's deployed, what kind of balance. I'm, I'm very curious to see actually uh, how he gets mixed into the offense early on, but he to me has a very very high floor in the NFL, and to that end, I, you know, I could see him being really useful, especially if God forbid uh, Kenneth Walker gets injured again. I think he can definitely step in and, and um, produce at a pretty high level. No, I, I 100% agree with you, Mina, and uh, it, it's actually the durability issue that it kind of ties into the, the question I have. As as Corbin just mentioned, um, you know, there, there's a lot of Seahawks fans out there who are very critical. Uh, of Seattle uh, allocating these multiple draft picks at, at running back. 
Um, you know, and obviously the two years in a row here, but you know, the first round pick just a couple of years before Rashad Penny as well. Uh, to me, the the one thing that if I was to criticize the Seahawks a little bit, uh, to me, it's the allocation of funds at the safety position. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just obviously with Jamal Adams and, and the injury issues that, that he has had since uh, we know what a terrific player that Quandre Diggs is, but he is an aging and undersized player. They bring in Julian Love as well. They're paying an awful lot of money, more than any other team in the NFL at, at safety. Now, you know, the Seahawks know as well as anybody how important secondary play is. And this is a legion of bloom, baboom after all. But still, in your personal opinion, I mean, what did what were your thoughts when the Seahawks made the trade for Jamal Adams? And how do you envision um, this possible three safety look? And do you think that it, it could work with um, Adams returning with Quandre Diggs and the free agent Julian Love? Yeah, this is another one where there's kind of like value in players, right? Because I really like the Julian Love signing. I think he's a really underrated player, versatile, and um, yeah. I just frankly don't know what they're going to get out of Adams. But even if Adams was healthy, I think he's not the player in coverage that they might have hoped for with the trade or that would have made the trade um, from a value perspective. I think it would have taken a lot for it to add up. And I think now in retrospect, we can see it was frankly a bad trade. But, um, you know, with with Adams, um, he, he has some limitations as a player in that regard. And I think Julian Love fills that gap and that gives you um, insurance and potentially we'll see what happens with Diggs after this season. Um, but they have some, he has, um, I think a lot of utility as a post player. Um, so as far as like the players go, I love the idea of them playing a lot of dime. And, uh, I think it frees up Jamal Adams to be used, uh, doing the things he does best, whether that's blitzing, playing close to the box, moving around, um, as a, as a matchup guy, I think it, it, this is a team that's probably going to be their best in dime. However, um, and this is where we look at the Charbonnet pick, you look at sort of the allocation of resources still, obviously, and you guys know this very well, major, major questions in that front seven. So um, while again, I like the players, I like the ideas of it. I do question from a value perspective, whether they threw enough at, at on both sides, actually, I would argue the trenches, uh, and I think that's going to be an issue uh, for this team. This episode is brought your way by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA Finals because right now new customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. And then you can bet on everything from the money line to points scored and three-pointers drained. I'm a huge fan of player prop parlays, and you can make bets such as Jimmy Butler scoring 20 points at minus 1,000 in game two of the NBA Finals. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. There's no better place to bet on all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. You mentioned that you liked the love signing and the Seahawks normally are not very aggressive spending money in free agency, but they were on the defensive side of the football. I'm curious though, from, I guess you could say now a little bit of an outsider's perspective covering the entire league now for ESPN. They have played musical chairs with this defensive line. Al yeah. Woods, Quentin Jefferson, Shelby Harris are all gone. They've brought in Draymond Jones, Jaron Reed's back. They drafted several players. Brian Monet, we don't know if he's going to be back anytime soon, coming back from a torn ACL. So you could have almost all new faces out there on that defensive line. What is your viewpoint of the state of that line right now here in early June? And do you think that this is still a position group where, say, if they could find a way to bring back a player like Harris, who's still a free agent, do you see that still being the area that is most pressing concern-wise going into this season? Well, who's the nose? I don't even know. This is why I'm glad to be here. You guys can tell me. Is it one of the Cameron Young, your fourth round pick out of Mississippi Jesus. State, looks like yeah. he's going to be the guy right now. I but. mean, that's that's a huge freaking problem, right? So yeah, I, that's something that obviously needs to be addressed, regardless of um, what sort of lineup they're rolling out. Um, I, I liked the Draymond Jones signing. He's a really good player. Advanced metrics love him. Um, our pass rush win rate he's like six overall or something and i think the fact that they are that was their big offseason investment 
um, reflects what the free agency looked like in terms of the lack of edge rushers, top end, edge rushers, there just weren't any, right? Um, the problem for the team, and I think, um, you know, going after again Witherspoon, who's a fabulous player, is um, I, I think Chenna Nosu is a really great number two edge rusher, but this is a team that's still missing a number one. And you're betting on, as you guys know, a bunch of second, third or rookies and Derek Hall to step up and, you know, uh, produce on the outside. It's just a big, massive question mark. I do think Jones getting interior push will help, especially you help Nosu again, and maybe he makes another leap, which, um, you know, really good player. So I think if he can, if he even improves, that should certainly help. But unless, whether it's Hall or um, Mafe or Robinson, one of these guys can get you like eight plus sacks. This is still a defensive line that's really lacking. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you used kind of, uh, you know, the term there is Uchenna Nuosu is like the number two pass rusher. And I, I've tried to use a, a similar analogy, kind of mixing sports analogies, saying like, you know, you want a, a, that ace pitcher, um, but you know, it feels like the Seahawks have a whole bunch of number twos but they don't have that ace yeah. edge rusher. One position that I thought that they needed to have an ace is that linebacker. And of course they got Bobby Wagner back. Um, you know, I focused so much in on, on the Seahawks perspective that I did not see as much of Bobby Wagner in his one season with the LA Rams as perhaps you did, yeah. or Devin Bush for that matter with the Pittsburgh Steelers. I, I'm curious in your opinion, what should the Seahawks be expecting with this reunion with Bobby Wagner? Um, is he going to play to the level that we saw, at least in flashes? Of, again, I saw him against the Seahawks, and Wagner was all over <laughs> Dude, the field. That was his best the game. <laughs> against the Seahawks. Against and they the Seahawks, expect yeah. that. And same thing with Devin Bush. Do you have any yeah. thoughts on, on Seattle's refurbished linebacking core? Yeah, well, so Wagner last year, look, he's not the player in coverage that he was during his prime in Seattle, but he's still a very good tackler. He's stout against the run. I think as a blitzer, too, he provides some utility. You saw that at times in Los Angeles, the way they used him in conjunction with Ernest Jones. So I think like as a piece, um, he's still a very useful player, to say nothing of obviously mentally what he brings to the team, calling it defense. Um, and I think in a universe where Jordan Brooks comes back healthy, I don't know what his injury timeline is. I, I do like those players working together. Although again, I still feel like in coverage, there's going to be some issues at linebacker. Um, Devin Bush, you know, just simply didn't live up to his draft status in Pittsburgh, major issues in coverage. Um, something that I opposing offenses targeted him a lot with great success so I'd have to see, he'd have to, that would be more of a kind of like a reclamation for me. And, and perhaps, you know, they, they saw something in him they liked and, and maybe they think he's capable of that, but I would, he'd have to play a lot better than he did in Pittsburgh for me to be excited about him on this team. Mina looking big picture. This is a football team that won nine games. They got to the playoffs last year without Russell Wilson, without Bobby Wagner. They do have number 50 for class. They're really excited about last year's draft class was probably the second best that they have had behind that 2012 group. So looking at this team right now as constructed, there's clearly some flaws, as you mentioned, with the defensive line. But what do you think is the best case realistic scenario for this football team? I know that there's 12s out there saying, hey, we can get to the Super Bowl with this team. Geno Smith, year two, is a starter. We've got more talent on both sides of the ball. But what do you think is that best case realistic scenario? Is it making a run deep in the playoffs, or are you ready to already damper those expectations? <laughs> water out of here in yeah. early June. There's absolutely a playoff team, especially given what's happening, not just in the NFC, but in the NFC West in particular, where you have two, one team that's very blatantly t tanking in, in Arizona and another team in Los Angeles where no one really knows what the hell is going on. Um, but, you know, so there's very, some very, very winnable games on that schedule. Um, you know, I'd still put them behind San Francisco, although we'll see what happens at the quarterback position there. Um, so I think like a realistic expectation would be getting into the playoffs and then winning a playoff game, unlike last season. I think this offense has the potential to be a total juggernaut. Uh, they There's no reason why they can't be a top five offense in the NFL 
Love the Jackson Smith Jigba pick for all the reasons I'm sure you guys have articulated, just like the perfect fit for player team need to, um, you know, really uh, combined with Charbonnet add to as well to really push uh, this unit even beyond where, where, what they were doing in the first half in particular of last season. So for me, the question of like, okay, well, what can they do to maybe not just win a playoff game, but actually like, you know, go beyond that. I think you, you would really need one of those pass rushers to step up um, because otherwise, and by the way, you know, there's still guys floating out there. I don't see, I don't have a lot of money though, so we'll see. But um, yeah, anyways, I, as much as I really, I think the secondary has the potential to be pretty special and really ascendant, but if they can't get more pass rush than they got last year, um, you know, it, it's hard for me to imagine this defense being average or better. The Seahawks have less money than I have in my wallet. And right now <laughs> I have literally a dime and a nickel yeah. in there. So it's going to be difficult for them, at least right now, without making any more restructures right. to add any more talent. But of course, we know the salary cap. You can always make things happen. Before we let you go real quick, Mean, I just want to know, you've said what the expectations are, but how many games does this team win? And you said they're a playoff team. Do you think they win the division or is it another wild card for the Seahawks? I've still got San Francisco. That's just their roster is so deep. The defense too looks like an absolute nightmare um, with the Hargrave addition. Uh, so I have them as a wild card team. I think I went through the schedule on NFL Live when it was released and I can't remember if I gave them 10 or 11, but it was one of those two, 10 or 11 wins, which should be enough. And again, it's, CX are very lucky to be in the NFC West. They're very lucky to be in the NFC this year. So that really should be all it takes to get in the playoffs. She's Mina Kimes from ESPN. Awesome guest. We've greatly appreciated having you on and looking forward to this upcoming season. We'll see what the Seahawks do for an encore and what Geno Smith does for an encore after stunning everybody in 2022. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s, whether you're listening in nearby Idaho or you're overseas listening from Spain. We greatly appreciate you making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. For our everydayers out there, coming up on Monday, we're going to put a bow on OTAs and we're going to preview the upcoming three-day mandatory minicamp. You're actually going to see a lot of the veterans that haven't been in Seattle, they will at least be in attendance to watch that, that coming up here. So let's shift gears now, Rob. It's Forecast Friday. We're going to be looking at individual players every Friday, breaking down how their previous season went and looking towards the future, making some projections for 2023. DK Metcalf kicked off the series last week. It's time to move to the defense. And we talked about him with Mina Kimes a little bit, but Quandre Diggs, it's a breath of fresh air for him. He's not rehabbing from a nasty broken leg, dislocated ankle like he was this time last year. He couldn't even cut yet at this time last year. But he played in all 17 games. He had four interceptions. He made his third consecutive Pro Bowl team. Let's talk about that 2022 season because obviously coming back from an injury, he got off to a bit of a sluggish start. But still, when you look at the stats – he stacked up favorably against any of the free safeties in the NFL last year. No, he, he really did. I mean, and Quandre Diggs is such a good football player. I mean, I and, and I I have to kind of eat a little bit of crow here because I, I was one of those who was critical of Quandre Diggs. There, there were some missed tackles early in the season. There were some missed interceptions early in the season. But as the Seahawks started playing well uh, down the stretch, I, I thought that one of the, the big catalysts of that was just the improved play of number six. I, I thought that he was absolutely terrific. It was very uh, justified in his making the, the Pro Bowl, um, you know, yet again. Um, and I am even more excited about what I think could be happening here in the future because, as you mentioned, Corbin, he was coming uh, off, off of the, the major knee injury and had to recover from that. And so because of that fact, uh, he did start the season slow. Um, but again, I, I do think that he is going to be able to kind of hit the ground running earlier in the season. And when we talked with Mina, one of the things that, that she pointed out was just the, the lack of quality in the NFC West specifically. And I think that that's going to tie in uh, to this as well. It's one of the reasons why I think the Quandra Diggs could be in line for some really eye-popping production um, as, uh, you know, really the, the game changer, the, the ball hawk in Seattle secondary. 
Yeah, as you mentioned, there were some missed tackle issues. According to Pro Football Focus, had over a 15% missed tackle rate. Now, speaking with the player, he doesn't necessarily agree with that number because there is some subjectivity to what missed tackles look like. Sometimes you miss a guy, but it goes into the inside of the defense and it makes it easier for teammates. You know, sometimes I guess you could say not all missed tackles are created equal. And you can say that about a lot of different statistics, but he also had four interceptions in the final seven games. He didn't have any the first 10. Again, that slow start, but he got back to his ball hawking ways in those final seven games, had that critical overtime interception in week 18 against Baker Mayfield and the Rams. So he has extended his streak now. He's the only player in the league, Rob, six straight years with at least three interceptions. You want to talk about consistency, and yet he has not been able to get that all-pro vote. I actually thought at the end of last year, and we talked about it, I thought that he was deserving with the way he played the second half of the season. I didn't necessarily see anybody that had elite numbers. He was first in completions allowed. First in completion percentage against, first in receiving yards against at the safety position. All three of those categories, he was in first place. So he had a really strong season with all things considered. And I think that's what gives me the most excitement going this year. Because normally you don't see Quandre Diggs drop interceptions. If the football is in his zone and he's got a chance to jump the ball, he's going to make plays and he is going to create turnovers seeing passes bounce off his chest like the one in week 15 against the 49ers last year like he doesn't miss plays like that and so I would expect that you're not going to see all those missed opportunities I think the tackling is a bit cleaner just having a normal off season and I think the other thing to consider here Seattle might not have that number one ace pitcher off the edge we were talking about earlier on the show but they've got a lot of number twos and I feel like the addition of Draymond Jones in the interior, and I think Jaron Reed can still give you a little bit of punch rush in the passer. I think that their pass rush is going to be significantly better than it was last year. I don't know if the run defense is going to be any better than it was last year, but the pass rush is going to be better. You're going to have Devin Witherspoon and Tariq Woolen as your corners. You're hoping to get Jamal Adams back healthy. You've got Julian Love. I just think the supporting cast, especially those guys up front, speeding up the clock for quarterbacks that's going to lead to more forced throws and you know who's really good at feasting on forced throws number six Quandre Dick so I think he's got a great opportunity this year to take the numbers he had last year which still quite frankly were really darn good even with the slow start he's got a chance with that better supporting cast to maybe finally break through as an all pro caliber player I'm stunned that he's only had two years he's gotten all pro votes for the Seahawks I 100% agree with you, uh, you know, and as you said, I think that an improved Seattle pass rush is going to create more opportunities where quarterbacks are going to get flustered and they're going to throw the ball up, up for grabs. Uh, again, I just kind of remind people uh, of the, the quality of quarterback play in not only the NFC West where you have the 49ers, but so, you know, supposedly the creme de la creme of the, of the division, of course, is going to have some rotation at, at the quarterback position this year. We don't know what's going to happen, whether it's going to be Brock Purdy, whether it's going to be Sam Darnold, or regardless, uh, you know, there's depth going to be transition from Jimmy Garoppolo uh, to whoever is the starting quarterback in San Francisco. Matthew Stafford is going to be back in L.A. And then, of course, the Arizona Cardinals, they're not going to have you know the, the dominant wide receiver in New Hopkins that they've had a, a lot over this time. So, again, there, there's going to be some opportunities out there for some big plays. You talked about the pass rush. I, I want to talk about the cornerback play as well. You know, one of the reasons why Quandre Diggs' interception numbers jumped so much in the second half of the season is because teams start to figure out that Tariq Woolen is also a ball hawk over there. And I think the NFL teams are going to continue to be very wary of Seattle's dom dynamic young cornerback on the one side. And who knows what's going to happen with Witherspoon on, on the other side. But if they are as good as we are anticipating, and if Seattle's nickel cornerback play also is that good, the pass rush is good, there's only so many plays, so many areas in which you can throw the football. And Quandre Diggs' instinct and ball skills, I think, again, to me, it's that combination is why I do think that there is a very good possibility that he's going to wind up being the NFL defensive back who is the first guy to do it seven years in a, with three, uh, seven consecutive years with three plus interceptions, just because it really does set up very nicely for him this upcoming season. And as Mina mentioned before, um, you know, the, the salary cap implications. I mean, this is a guy who's entering the final year of, of his deal. He is going to be playing to try and get another big contract as well. So there's all those 
individual as well as team incentives pushing him also. Yeah, I think from a production standpoint, and we're doing this every week on Forecast Friday, I'm not a fantasy football player. Rob, I know you have a little more background on that than what I do. But from a projection standpoint, as I mentioned earlier, the consistency that Quandre Dig has had. He's been available. He makes plays on the football. He comes up and he hits people. If we're taking injuries out of the equation, Diggs did start all 17 games last year. Based on a 17-game schedule, he had 71 tackles last year. I think with his ability to come up in the box occasionally, they move him around some in this defense. I think getting in the 70s, again, you don't want 93 tackles like he had two years ago. That means your front seven is just getting obliterated and you're having too many plays in the field. But for me, 74 tackles. He's had five interceptions in two of the past three seasons. He almost got there last year. So I think it's a really safe bet that he's going to get five picks. I've got seven pass breakups. 158 yards allowed, a passer rating of 78.3. I do expect there's going to be some missed tackles, just his style. He flies at people, and sometimes he comes up short. I think the drop interception is going to get cut down, though. He had four last year, which was tied for second among safeties in the league. That is not Quandre Diggs. I would expect there might be one or two sprinkled in the season. But as far as I'm concerned, this is a chance for Quandre Diggs with the improved cornerback play on both sides the improved pass rush year two in this scheme. I think Clint Hurt's got a better idea what he wants to do this season schematically. He's got better personnel at all three levels to be able to maximize that scheme. I just think all those factors together and the fact that Diggs is fully healthy, he just had his second child. So things are going really well off the field for him as well, uh, other than his golf swing. Uh, That's kind of an inside joke, but anyway, uh, Everything's going well for Quandre Diggs. He's much healthier. I just think this is a great opportunity for him. I don't want to say breakout year because he's been really damn good the last three and a half years. But I think this is a chance maybe from a national perspective for him to get that attention that I think he has deserved the last few years and hasn't gotten. Yeah, I I 100% agree with you again. uh, I think that when you put those statistics up there, I think that those are all very realistic numbers. Um, And the missed tackles, I I love that you – I uh, kind of explain that a little bit. It, it is really a, a case of perspective um, because there are a lot of tackles I can think of where Quandre Diggs comes in like he is shot out of a canyon and, and he leaves his feet and he basically, um, you know, just, is trying to pile drive the running back or the ball carrier and they see him coming and then go back inside to contact where somebody else makes the actual tackle. And it looks like Quandre Diggs missed the tackle, but instead he was basically just corralling the ball carrier back into the support of his teammates. So I think true missed tackles, I think there's a possibility that Quandre Diggs is down in the single digit range, maybe even one hand, you know, five, five or less kind of missed tackles. But knowing the way that, uh, that people grade these things, I would not be surprised at all if that number is closer to double-digit numbers like that. Even though, again, as you said before, and we both very much believe Quandra Diggs is absolutely a Pro Bowl caliber player, and clean open field tackles is a critical part of his game. Really is. Maybe the best last chance with him being 30 now, and I'm not saying he doesn't have a lot of good football in front of him, but once you hit the 30 mark and he's in year nine, who many know? who knows how many more chances he's going to have to play at this elite level where he can be a first or second team all pro. It feels like the stars are aligned schematically, the players around him, his health, where he's at in his career. Those stars are all aligned for him to have a monster season. If the Seahawks go out and win 10, 11, 12 games, they win the NFC West maybe this year. If that ends up happening and Diggs is a catalyst on that defense for one of the best teams in the NFC, then he is going to ramp up his opportunity to finally get that elusive all pro selection that you and I feel like he probably should have had at least one or two of to this point, but it's never too late to get one of those and add it to your resume. One of the best states in football, hoping to add that to his three pro bowls that he's had in his time with the Seahawks. As always, you can follow me on Twitter, Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Subscribe and follow Locked on Seahawks on Apple podcast, YouTube, and wherever you listen to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. When we come back on Monday, we're going to put a bow on OTAs. The final open OTA was on Thursday, and then we're going to shift gears previewing the upcoming mandatory mini camp from June 6th to June 8th. You won't want to miss it. Enjoy your weekend. Go Hawks.